So on behalf of SUNY College of Optometry, we are so pleased to present our second luminary series, Art and Visual Perception, Why You See What You See. The luminary series was created in celebration of the college's 50th anniversary, highlighting the importance of sight, caring for our vision, and the exceptional, exceptional education, patient care, and research conducted here at the college. Before we begin, I'm gonna start a few housekeeping items. Um, first, this program is being recorded. It will be shared with all of those who have registered in the next few days. The content is for informational and educational purposes only. It should not be reproduced or shared without permission. And additionally, the views of the panelists should not be construed to represent the views of the college. We hope you enjoy this discussion. Questions are certainly welcome, and we ask that you please place them in the Q&A section at the bottom of your screen. We will try to get to all the questions asked, time permitting, of course. And lastly, enjoy this evening. If you want to learn more about our presenters and or their organizations, web links will be posted at the end of the presentation, as well as included in the follow-up email after the session. For those of you who are not familiar with the college, I'm gonna share just a few quick points. Uh, SUNY College of Optometry is one of the top ed optometric education and research institutions in the country, training the next generation of eye doctors and vision scientists. With approximately 50% of the licensed optometrists in New York State being our graduates, it is likely you have encountered one of our alumni at, at an eye doctor appointment. And along with residency and externship partners, we conduct over 240,000 patient visits annually, with nearly 70,000 of those occurring at our university eye center here on our campus across from Bryant Park. We have over 3,000 referring doctors, social workers, teachers, and others who rely on our recognized clinical faculty to help their patients. We are a chosen site for many clinical studies through our Clinical Vision Research Center as we serve those who live and work around the greater New York City area, which leads us to have a very diverse patient base. It's a great educational tool as, as well as a research tool. The University Eye Center never turns a patient away, regardless of their ability to pay. And that's thanks to the Optometric Center of New York, the college's affiliated foundation, and the many donors who support our charitable care fund. The OCNY also provides over $300,000 in scholarship support each year to SUNY optometry students, and over $100,000 to support research in eye health and vision science. Tonight's fun fact, Gershwin's Rhapsody in Blue debuted in our building in 1924, which at the time was then known as Aeolian Hall. We've been presenting some fun facts along the way for our 50th anniversary, and this is just one of those tidbits. Now on to our program. Tonight we are joined by Harry Bauer, board member and curator at the John F. Petto Museum. Mr. Bauer received the 2019 Distinguished Achievement Award from the Art Educators of New Jersey for his exceptional teaching and dedication to art education, along with other notable recognitions through grants and fellowships. The museum itself is dedicated to preserving the legacy of internationally recognized artist John F. Petto through celebrating his life and work with a collection of displays of his artworks, furniture, and artifacts. Their mission is to foster educational opportunities in the arts and partner with the larger community. We also have artist Christopher Rigney, whose more than 20 year career encompasses a wide variety of painting styles, including still life, figurative, and trompe l'oeil. He is trained with renowned artists, including Aude Nerdrum, Sergio Ladron de Guevara, Jacob Collins, and Yannick Gagan. For those who have had the pleasure of meeting him, he can regale you with the stories from his many adventures and life as a true Renaissance man. And we also have SUNY faculty member, distinguished professor and researcher, uh, having been at the college for over 25 years, Dr. Kazem Zaidi. Uh, Dr. Zaidi has had uh, taught at Columbia, and at SUNY with a focus on visual perception and neural mechanics. Through research, published articles and presentations, Dr. Zaidi has deeply contributed to the field of vision. He's currently organizing the annual Vision NYC meeting, which I have the privilege of working with him on as well, and brings vision scientists from around the greater New York City area together for a day long conference and sharing of information. So welcome to you all, and thank you so much for joining us. We're gonna start the evening with Harry Bauer who will share more about the John F. Petto Museum and the, the style of trompe l'oeil painting. Harry. 
Hi, how are you doing? First of all, thank you for this opportunity uh, to talk about the legacy of John F. Pito. Um, I will probably hit on some things that Chris will probably be talking about also about the definition of Trump loy, uh, fool your eye. It's a very old technique going back to Greek and Roman times and some Egyptian times where they would paint murals to look like you're looking outside into a courtyard or looking outside of a window. Um, but we're very fortunate that at the museum, we've had um, the granddaughter of John F. Pito preserve um, his artifacts, his furniture. Uh, we were also very fortunate that recently the building went through a $2 million restoration and that our nonprofit group just was able to take it over in last September. So we're all nonprofit and 99% uh, volunteers. So Anissa, if I could do the first slide, please. Just wanna share with you some of the uh, images. Uh, that's the exterior of the museum um, only taken yesterday. So um, those are the original colors that he, when he lived there, when they did the restoration of the building, they went through 60 samples of paint to find the colors on the outside and the inside of the work. Um, for me, Trump Loy is, um, is a, a genre of art that fools your eye or tricks your eye. Um, the next slide, please. I'll do some of the character. Uh, oh, that's, okay. that's the interior of Pito. And again, we're fortunate. That's his chair, his easel. Even in the photograph you see is uh, Pito sitting at his chair doing a, a landscape painting. Um, and some his brushes. We have three of, three of his palettes and 60 of his brushes. So we're very fortunate to have that also. And those are the colors when he actually lived there. Uh, next slide, please. Um, a, a quick definition of what Trump Loy is about, and I'm sorry, Chris, if I'm hitting on some of your stuff, but commonplace objects painted with meticulous precision, flat surfaces stop the eye while objects placed on the surface seem to come forward. Uh, the artist uses shadows of objects to suggest, suggest depth instead of perspective. Um, quite often the objects are uh, full size. Um, an example might be that um, if he's going to do a picture, of, a painting of a beer mug, it's not going to be three feet tall. It's going to be the actual size it would be in reality. And very rarely do you see um, living objects, animals, people. You'll see them in postcards. You'll see them in the uh, 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 photographs he uses, but you usually won't see uh, a fly. Uh, Raphael, a Dutch painter, would probably use, um, you might see a, a um, a bee or um, yeah, a bee or a fly on a piece of fruit that you know would tell you that it's going to fly away. Um, next slide, please. Uh, just a, I, I want to share with you an example of like, the history of, of some of the Trump Loy uh, painting a flat surface to look like a vaulted ceiling. Um, I saw the word that describes that or what the, you know, what it's, and I can't remember where I've seen it. So um, this is just a, a poster that we had in one of our exhibits of an artist from Romania. Um, but just to show you how it back during Renaissance times, how they would paint a flat ceiling to look vaulted. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, this is a, a photograph. Uh, actually, this is one of our prints that we own. Um, and it's more of a rack painting where you're gonna see upright flat composition inspired by Dutch paint, school of painting. Uh, you'll see the crisscrossing of the ribbons or tapes, um, objects are shallow. Um, that might be an example of one of the ones he might have done for a commission piece for um, that gentleman. Um, I haven't figured out uh, who the uh, who the uh, the um, the gentleman who wanted to buy this have him paint it for him. I can't remember who did that, or I can't find out who did that. But against a flat surface, maybe a wall, a door, scraps of paper nailed to the wall, um, the letters, you know. So forth. I'm so, I'm trying to find that magazine that's there, um, in a, in, you know, just to try to find to see what it was about. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, this is a patch painting. Okay, um, almost abstract. You know, unusual colors, textures, um, the overlapping of shapes. Uh, sometimes torn paper, as if somebody just randomly tore things off. But we can find out the way that he was um, working into his surfaces where that TRYC is, he's scratched into the surface. It's from the Tom's River Yacht Club Commodore, uh, painted 1904. And the gentleman's photograph is the Commodore um, of the Yacht Club at that time. And um, even down to the, you know, the, post, um, the postmark on the lower envelope, um, I found out it's um, 
from Shikshini, Pennsylvania. And I was born in the town right next door to Shikshini, Pennsylvania. Um, but the ribbons are, and the tapes are gone. So it's a more, again, a flat surface, uh, use of um, the nails sticking out of the wall on the lower right-hand side. Uh, the shadow, the use of the shadows, the shadows on the uh, photograph, uh, the shadows under that torn piece of blue paper is what gives us the illusion of the depth without using actual perspective. Um, okay, next one, please. Hope I'm not going through these too quickly. Uh, this is a painting, um, and I put down the measurements. It's actually 40 inches high by 30 inches wide. This is a print that we have in our collection. The Brandywine River Museum actually owns it. And when I went to the Brandywine River Museum and I saw this painting, I talked to their curator. I'm like, uh, we've got all those objects in our collection. Um, the powder horn, the Bowie knife, uh, the bugle and the canteen and that photograph of a building. And it wasn't until I started to do some um, research, actually by accident, I was in Philadelphia and I opened a book um, saw called Now and Then or Before and After. And that building is actually a building called the Vol Union Volunteer Refreshment Saloon that was a, a halfway point from going to the war or coming back from the war. Um, and then I actually found more information in a book about that building. That's actually a print uh, that he would use also. He would do paintings of paintings or paintings of prints. So the next slide, please, shows the actual objects we have in a showcase. Um, and again, they would be in, uh, when, when you see the actual painting, that key bugle, that bowie knife, you can almost hold them up to the painting and they would be the actual size um, in the painting and the canteen and so forth. Uh, next slide. I hope I'm not rushing too quickly. Uh, this is one that we just recently got, and this is more of like a, a, a letter. I call it a letter rack instead of a rack painting, but a letter rack. Um, it's to an HD Van Sant Esquire. Um, we we just got this one on loan about two weeks ago. Um, so it's we're finding out some more research on it. But when we got it, I actually got to look at it closer under the word Island Heights is Brooklyn, New York. So we have to figure out what that significance is. But uh, Mr. Van Sant actually was the uh, mayor of Island Heights at one time also. Okay, next slide, please. Uh, this, is, um, this is part of a mural that Pito did um, in one of the rooms, an entire mural around the entire room of a bookshelf. Uh, that texture on the mug, another trick that he might have used is called empasto. And it's showing texture on it. He's trying to show the texture of salt glazes. And you notice the string hanging down on the book. Things are, you know, kind of like laying against each other. And really last week, somebody came in and said to me, I haven't hung at like eye level. Somebody said it actually should be hung up near the ceiling because you would be looking under, to fill your eye, you would be looking under the book, under the shelf. And the next slide is a continuation of that mural. Um, and there you can see the, the use of the nail uh, torn pieces of paper. This was one we found out once we got the other uh, piece of the mural that the family would cu cut sections out of the wall to sell it. And we found out that there were 11 sections that encircled the entire room um, upstairs. Um, I, uh, I only have found two pieces so far, so we're still on the lookout. I think Yale University might have one uni Yale University of Art might have one piece of it. Um, so the next slide, please. Oh, okay, so now we're, these are some contemporary artists that we have in our display or exhibit right now. Um, this is Gary Irby from Nutley, New Jersey. I want to share that this one with you because again, he's using that trick of fooling your eye with the shadows. He's using that trick of the string hanging down. That board, the cutting board is actually a canvas. It's not uh, a cutting board he painted on top of. He painted the, the canvas to look like a cutting board. Uh, next slide, please. Um, oh, Chris, I, I saw yours real quick, um, one of yours. This is um, Wynn Ziberon. He's from um, Levitt, New York, and he's part of our exhibit right now also. Um, again, using that nail that Peter would use, you know, showing us the nail, the string hanging off, the use of the shadows. 
Um, I had a group uh, there yesterday and I, one lady actually wanted to touch the nail. So to make sure that it was, wasn't, you know, uh, it wasn't a real nail. Um, but I like the way that all his frames, all his, that's a flat canvas. There is no depth to it. There's no, you know, if I, sh I think the next shot slide might even show you another example of it that that's all flat surface. This one's called, I told you not to shake the bottle. Um, a little sense of humor there. That's a totally flat surface uh, that Wynn has worked with. And there's one more that Wynn, if you, next slide, please. And again, a close up of what Wynn has done with that use of the nail, the string going across the canvas and, and the, flat, um, the flat canvas of the frame. So it looks like that. Uh, but we're really fortunate that, um, you know, we are the only historic artist home and studio on the list of 48 of them is, uh, throughout the United States. And we're the only one in New Jersey. We're open to the public on Saturdays and Sundays. I think that's the end of my slides. Yeah, that was part of, um, that was one, that one was part of Hey Dude. But we're very fortunate that we've been able to have the artifacts. So when you, I, we have so many other paintings. We have 22 pedal paintings in, uh, on, ex, on display right now. And we have the candlesticks, we have the, the, the pot. So um, we got one painting on loan and I actually took the kettle from the display and held it up to make sure it was the right size or that I used a, a tray and I took it down from the shelf and made sure it was the right size. So um, just it's just a remarkable um, opportunity for us to, to have these objects and share them with people. So Harry, I think I probably would be the person who is trying to wipe the ink off of the, I told you not to shake the bottle. Yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> it, it, it's, and that, that's, that's what makes me like, okay, we did it. You know, we fooled your eye. We made the people um, see stuff. I understand that um, when he had the mural around the entire room, there was a series of nails that people tried to hang a coat on, you know, the, the way that he was fooling your eye. But I hope I gave you enough of like a, a quick, you know, definition or explanation of what Trump Loy is about from the pedal aspect of it. Oh, one more thing, and then, then I'll, I'll shut up, um, is that I just went to the Jasper Johns exhibit in Philadelphia um, a couple of weeks ago. And again, randomly by accident, I picked up a while ago, a Jasper Johns book, opened it up, and there's a pedal in there. Um, I have it with me, but I tried showing it, it doesn't look look good and it was the first time that jasper johns gave credit to another artist who inspired him to do his work i went to the show and the painting is right there and it's called pedo johns the painting it's the third painting in the exhibit as i walked around jasper johns using a trick of the nail with the shadow hanging off everyday objects the broom um the way he was using shadows and actually even today uh, um I was at the museum and Jasper Johns uses one of these tricks of a piece of paper folded over the canvas. And there's, there it is in Peter, one of Peter's rack paintings. So that's Excellent. my next goal is to do like an article about how much is, was he influenced by? Him. Possibly. So that's a great bit of background about Trump Loy. Um, and, you know, my first experience with Trump Loy was actually um, putting my hand on what I thought was a brick wall, and it turned out to be some uh, plaster and and wood. And but I, I swore it was brick, and that it was going to it was behind a wood stove. I thought it was going to be hot, and it wasn't. It was perfectly cool. Um, but it, it, that was um, interesting. And I think as we we move on, we're going to move to um, Rigney and um, his demonstration. Right now, we'll start to see some of that those elements as well. I think we're going to be talking about Trump Loy painting, which means to fool the eyes. And when it comes to painting, that's a pretty broad category. Many people instantly think of easel paintings, um, such as the ones with the ribbons going across and the letters stuck in there, or the uh, photos pinned up on them, or even the boy climbing out of the frame. However, Trump Loy painting can encompass much more, which includes murals, rendered architectural details that you would find in Renaissance ceilings, faux moldings, and even matte paintings from film production. That's where you have a sheet of glass that you paint on and you put it between the camera and the scene so you can create a whole nother effect. In general, the uh, idea of Trump Loy painting is to paint something that's indistinguishable from the real. And with that in mind, 
there is one kind of hard rule for Trump Lloyd painting, and that's that the objects represented must appear to be actual size. Because if they don't appear to be actual size, then the spell is broken, or worse yet, it's the illusion is never created. My Trump Lloyd experience started off Emerson College in the theater, and while getting my degree in theater design and technology, Emerson had this philosophy that everybody worked in the field in which you were practicing, which meant you got lots of hands-on experience. And part of that, for me, was doing backdrop paintings in the scene shop for the theater. And scenic painting for theater encompasses lots of trompe l'oeil elements. Um, using forced perspective to create depth, using light and shade to create volumes, and just in general, the whole idea of creating a whole new world up there on the stage. After graduating, I went on to study trompe l'oeil painting of Yannick Gigant in France. And his school was a mixture of being a school and an apprenticeship, which is a fancy way of saying he made you clean the studio a lot and clean his brushes. And I'd like to use that as a starting point for this evening. While at Yannick's, you learned a large variety of natural materials, wood, uh, marble, fabrics. You learned to render all these things. And when he thought you had sufficiently learned how to do these things, he'd have you paint a sample panel. And these sample panels were four by eight panels. And the idea of them was is that you could roll them up, take them with you, and show them to potential clients, um, like interior designers, architects, uh, you know, clients that wanted murals. And you would unroll them, and then this way they could see the type of work that you would do and the quality of work. Um, so with that, I would like to uh, start off there taking a look at a few of these, a quick look, um, going through some of the materials that we use, and then at the end do a paint demo to show you how you layer the paints to create the different effects for the trompe l'oeil. This was actually the first trompe l'oeil panel I painted at Yannick's. At the time I spoke absolutely no French, and it seemed to contribute generally to his grumpy disposition toward me. He would come over and paint like these two square inches, all the while talking away about what I could only assume was proper technique or some secret about how to create a better trompe l'oeil panel. He'd look over at one of the other students to translate, and all I would ever get is, maybe less darks? Yannick would nod satisfied, and then he'd just hand me the brushes and walk off. What really helps create the illusion of the trompe l'oeil in this panel, besides the light and shade, is the use of perspective lines in the brickwork bending into the niche. Perspective and drawing can really give you more space to work with. And you want a person looking at the panel to feel like they can step right into that space. Drapery is a classic device in trompe l'oeil murals. It lets you get in some softer textures and creates volumes in the folds and is a great way to play with the light. Oftentimes you can get really interesting shadow shapes that also help with the composition. The pedestal marble is an antique green breccia, which is actually surprisingly hard to paint with all its randomness. When I'm painting, I'm constantly trying to organize things, but with this marble, its beauty is found in the chaos. The background has a similar challenge as you put down the base coat, and then with a sponge full of alcohol, you take off swipes, let it drip and splatter. It's something that takes a little getting used to, and it's about trusting the process that's gonna end up in the right direction that you wanna go at the end. Here we have a marble inlaid floor panel. While the individual pieces of marble are very busy, it was designed to have maximum graphic impact as a whole. All the details are the secondary wow factor that helps support the trompe l'oeil illusion if somebody was to get up close to it. I've used the black uh, Portaro and the white inlaid marble to create a smaller frame within to help pull the focus toward the center, where we have a circle of the long duck pushing right out to the borders. That was to create visual tension. The release then comes from the burst of yellow in a grand antique star with an almost an explosion outward. While it's painted as a floor panel, the inlaid marble is a great way to add elements to, let's say, tabletops and door panels. The inlaid heron is one of my wife's favorite panels. The main purpose behind this panel was to showcase various woods and the exotic marquetry. 
The light yellow is a pitch pine, and the main wood paneling is made up of cherry. Both were chosen because they are visually calmer and would not distract from the center motif. One of the great things about trunkloid painting is that you can use exotic woods or extinct materials. So the heron, for example, and the water are both made up of ivory. The tail feathers and the fish are ebony. And the heron body and the reeds coming over the top are a rosewood. The illusion of depth is created by light striking from the top right hand corner and casting a shadow down to the left. We'll get more to that later in the paint demo. All right, gonna move on to the fun parts now. I'm gonna paint a trumpeloy sample. What I've prepped out here is a board with a smooth surface. A smooth surface in trumpeloy painting is important. Um, the way we see textures is light skips across a surface, catches the ridges, and then creates shadows on the other side. Now, real life textures, if they are inside your trompe-l'oeil painting, can actually confuse it. You get light in the shadow area and shadow in the light area. So smooth surface to start is what we're gonna work with. The next thing is we're gonna work with acrylic materials for the underpainting. Now, acrylics are a modern material, and the reason I use those for the underpainting is they dry quickly. Traditionally, you can use egg tempera, or you can even use um, other oil paints. The disadvantage to oil paint is that it takes 24 to 48 hours to dry before you can put sub subsequent layers on it. So we're gonna start out with acrylic, quick drying to get our underpainting and then finish with oil. I have here a variety of brushes. These are all acrylic brushes. Um, I will explain and give you names and stuff like that as we go along in doing this demo. All right, what we're gonna start out here is a wood sample. We're gonna start with some white, put some yellow in there. All right, we're gonna be doing a darker wood for this example. So what I'm gonna to try to do is get some wood graining in there right from the beginning. So for the next layer, we're gonna mix up something just a little bit darker. So now the next thing what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a flogger and since we have two pieces of wood, and we're gonna start getting the wood grain in there right away. All right, and we'll let those dry up. But as you can see, we've already started to get a direction in the grain going with a little bit of tapping. There we go. All right, with this layer dry, and since we're painting a corner of two pieces of wood joined together, what I'm gonna do is use a little piece of tape here just so that my hands are not constantly in the way. Also, what I'm gonna do is paint two different grain patterns I wouldn't necessarily put together if I was actually doing this, but for a sample, to show you guys you know, a couple interesting things, we'll go ahead and do it. So, we'll get a little bit of color going. Now you notice I'm shaking my hand back and forth. And the idea is that you want to give some movement to the wood grain. So it has a more natural appearance. And actually we left a little space here. You know what, let's go ahead and drop in, let's drop in a knot. All right, and one last thing. Let's get some darks in on this side to get some variety. All right, now we're gonna let that dry up and then we'll put some oil glazes on top of it. Okay, all the acrylic underlayers have dried and you may have noticed we switched over to oil paint, so I'm gonna do the glazing now on top. Um, the glazing is a very thin layer that you can see through so that you can get more depth in the wood. And I'd also like to point out at this uh, stage, the yellow underneath that appeared to be very bright at first while we put more paint on top has, has dulled down a little bit, but you can still get that, that feel and glow coming through. So again, I'm gonna do a piece of tape on top just to save us the time and so that you can see with my hands out of the way. Um, this is a glaze medium that you mix up, uh, nothing, nothing special, just turpentine and oil. So I'm going to 
pick a couple of uh, paints here. Let's see, a little bit of red in that one. Uh, let's get it just a little bit darker. Let me make some adjustments. All right. Now, I don't know if it shows up on camera, but there's kind of like a rainbow of adjustments here. And it's very subtle, so you, it might not be, you know, as really obvious on camera. But we're going to use that little rainbow of colors even though, and to, to put the glaze on. Okay. Now, one of the things we're going to do is we're going to come in and create some striping in here. So there we are, we have two pieces of wood that are coming together at a corner joint. Now with the oil, we're gonna let it dry for 24 to 48 hours, it needs to be thoroughly dry. And then what we're gonna do is go in and create the trompe l'oeil effect where things are bending and shaping. All right, now that the oil layer has dried, um, basically overnight, day, day and a half, what we're gonna do is we're gonna add some light and shade to create a three-dimensional effect. Okay, what we're going to do is a light on this now, and what I've mixed up is white with a little bit of yellow in it just to warm it up so it's not so stark, so it doesn't look like I uh, have glare coming off the wood. I mean, if you were doing a highly polished surface and wanted glare, then, you know, bright white might be the way to go. But for this, we're going to just do a little warmer white. All right, and to get the separation, because it is two pieces of wood here, what we're gonna do is drop in a very thin line where you get the crack. All right, this brings us to the end. I hope you found the demo insightful as to one of the ways that I create trompe l'oeil paintings and one of the techniques that I use. No matter what technique you use to create trompe l'oeil painting, there are a couple things that are essential. One, you need to use solid light and shade, have good perspective, and it's a matter of developing the touch to know when to push hard and when to feather the paint out. And one of the elements that I think is often overlooked and is essential for trompe l'oeil painting is good eye health. It is Trump Lloyd to fool the eyes after all. Excellent, Chris. Thank you so much for putting together those explanations and that demonstration and the little pitch for getting your eyes checked because that is important. Um, I may have had a little something to do with putting you up to saying that, but uh, I appreciate it. Um, do you have anything you want to add after that video demo? Um, not right now. I'll be glad to take questions at the end. Let everybody do their, uh, do their thing first. Wonderful. All right. So with that, I'm going to um, turn this over now to Dr. Zadie, who's going to explain some of the, the more science, science behind why we're seeing what we're seeing. Dr. Zadie. Okay. So as uh, the two speakers said before, I think of Trump oil as photorealism that arouses touch. And I'll talk a little bit about some things we know uh, in visual neuroscience that help us understand what goes on. Uh, and then I'll tell you that there's a lot we still need to know. Okay. So here are two images, uh, dollar bills on a ground and uh, on top of a frame and one of the, them is a photo and one of them is a painting. 
And uh, if you are as skilled as Chris at painting, you probably can't tell which one is the painting and which one is the photo. Um, in this case, the photo is the one on the left. But in both cases, what we see is, as Chris said, essentially you're mimicking what's there. The right size, the right textures, the right lighting, the right shadows. Um, so to see the photorealism is again, the same thing we use in our brain to know whether we, when we are really looking at a scene like this, whether money is folded or rolled or misshapen, or in, in, the, in these two cases, whether the background is rough or smooth. So how do we go about doing this and what do we want to know? So here is a picture of a brain. Your brain doesn't look like this because it's gelatinous. This is somebody who unfortunately isn't alive anymore. Uh, so here is your eye and you may not see this, but there is an optic nerve that goes from the eye up to here to this part of the brain, which is called the thalamus. And from here, nerves go to the back of the brain. And this part here in the back, we call uh, the stride cortex or V1, which is the primary visual cortex. And the neurons here have a peculiar property. They respond best to patterns like this. So these are for two different neurons. And what you may notice is that one of them is vertically um, oriented and one of them is almost horizontal, but slightly obliquely. And we call that orientation. One of them has very fine, is responding to very fine grained changes and the other one to slightly coarser changes. And I will call that spatial frequency because you think of this as a frequency which is changing. So that's what happens at V1. There are banks and banks of these neurons and I'll show you those. And then there are many other stages, not very many, but four or five of, uh, uh, of visual parts of the brain. And then we come here to an area called the inferior temporal cortex. This is the last purely sensory area. And here, when you look at neurons, they can do very complex things, like tell you different faces. So what we want to know is how you go from here to here, how you extract 3D shapes, how do you extract material properties, given that you're beginning by looking at what's little patches of images, which are like this. These are pictures of very tiny portions of the brain. This is about the area of one point in space that you're looking at. And you see all these colors that's almost like a pinwheel pattern. And these are, this is an optical image of the surface of the brain. And what the colors are, are which orientations the cells in that patch respond best to. So they're color coded and you can see that for any place in the world, the brain is extracting in from the image all these different orientations and it's doing it in parallel. Similarly, these different colors are about scale, a core scale to a very fine scale. And this is also done in parallel. So to try to understand how we see shapes, how we see materials, this is where one begins. So one of the things one could do is you can make patterns which have different orientations. So this is a pattern which has just two orientations, horizontal and vertical. This one is harder for you to see, but it has eight orientations just like this, but it looks like rosettes. This one looks very much like this, but it has only seven. It's missing the horizontal one, and you'll see why in a second. Or you could make patterns out of dots, and this one is a very regular grid but all at the same size. And we can change the scale by randomizing sizes. Or we can randomize orientations by just randomizing locations. And so now what I'm going to do is think of those as pieces of cloth or paper, and I'm going to bend them into this shape like this, and then present them as if you were looking at the shape like this, 
and I'm driving, writing, the screen was just going through it. So the image on the screen is exactly if you were in the proper distance and closed one eye, exactly what would fall on one eye. And this is what you end up looking at. And this is a beautiful two dimensional gray level pattern and your eye and your brain obstinately probably sees this as deeper and these two parts as shallower. It's like a corrugation in depth, a concavity surrounded by two convexities. And here you see a similar thing, a little more complicated, but here you don't see that. Instead you see three pillars. And the only difference between this one and this one is that these horizontally, close to horizontal orientation changes, which I will call orientation flows are not present. Again, in this grid, you can see the same 3D shape because you see those same flows. And it doesn't matter if you change the sizes, you still see the same shapes, the flows, the same shape. But here, you don't see those orientation flows, you don't see the shape, you see three pillars just like this. So this is how we see 3D shape. Our brains extract orientation flows and from them, they judge whether you see shape or not. And now there are some textures in, in nature and man-made that will convey these shapes properly. So for the snake skin, you may see this as convex, this is concave, and this sort of wire thing, convex, concave. But for pebbles or for wood grain, which is vertical, you may not be able to tell which one is which, they look very similar. And we can predict this from the grains, about because from the patterns, from a thing called the Fourier transform, which tells us whether it will form these flows in your retinal images and you will see the shape or not. And once it forms the flows, your cells extract them in parallel and, and you see shape. And that is shape from texture or pattern. But the same thing is true if you see a shape from reflection. So you see this ellipsoid in 3D, but if you look, you see it much better in the top than on the bottom. But on the top, you get these orientations and these flows. Similarly, when you get shape from shading, like Chris was talking about, it may look to you like there's a smooth gradient of shading. But if you actually look at parts which are at exactly the same brightness, they form flows like this. And those are the flows from which we use to see shape from shading. So now I want to shift to materials. So if you take a large number of fabrics and you ask people to sort them into soft and rough and flexible and stiff and warm and cool and water absorbent and water repellent, they can do it pretty reliably. And then you can start thinking about what is different among these? Why from just these images can I tell what these will feel like? This, you can almost tell if you touch it, it's going to feel rough. This is going to feel soft. So again, we use this technical thing called a Fourier transform. So here is a fabric that people said was soft. This is rough. And these are the Fourier transforms. But essentially, I won't go into those, but what there is, is that the scale of changes is different here than here. Similarly, if you look at a flexible fabric, which has folds, whereas one which is stiff doesn't have folds, there are scales of light dark changes that are different here than here. And that's what's represented here. Similarly, if you take very similar ones, which are thick and thin, it's a scale that changes. And in fact, we can use this. So from here to here, which looks like an inflated and a deflated comforter, nothing, there's no inflation or deflation going on. I'm just in the images, in graphics, taking out power out of certain scales and putting power into certain scales, and that makes this change. Similarly, if I wanted to make a thicker thing thinner or back to thicker, it's just there's a band of scales that I change the power in. It's all completely done with, with digitized graphics. Similarly, I can go from rough to soft, and now it's a different band that I do it. 
So the distribution of scales in an image determines the perceived material properties. And, uh, and I showed you that there are cells specialized for different scales and they all work in parallel. And that's how we can extract these. So finally, we get to touch. And one of the fun things about trompe l'oeil is it's actually funny when somebody acts like they're fooled, they're trying to mount this horse or try, trying to fish for this shark. Of course, if they caught it, they would be in trouble. Um, and we are just beginning to explore in neuroscience the interaction between touch uh, and vision. I'm gonna give you one example. So we showed people pictures like this. Uh, so these are patterns folded like I showed you. So this is flat, convex, concave, slanted to the right, slanted to the left. These are exactly the same shapes, but this is the texture that doesn't give you these flows. So this is convex, looks convex. This is concave, but it looks convex. This is right slant and left slant, but they look slightly concave. So we presented them on a monitor and people could see them in a mirror. And the mirror was blocking where the hand was. And we could give people this force thing where we could make them think they were touching the surface and we could make them see a different depth tactile in the surface. And what we found was that when they saw the, when they felt the right depth, you actually started seeing these as different. You started seeing this as concave, this is right slanted and this is left slanted. But, and we could, then we could turn them around. We could see, make people see this as concave uh, and this is left slant and this is right slant just by how they touched it because these cues are ambiguous, but these cues are not ambiguous. And no matter how much you touched it, they looked like they did. So if you feel like you need to touch something in trompe l'oeil and you touch it, it's not going to change how you see it because the cues are very strong. So this is the final slide. So the brain processes orientations in parallel to, to enable estimating 3D shapes from orientation flows from patterns, from shading, and it processes scales in parallel to enable estimating material properties from ranges of scales. And such neural mechanisms enable photorealism in images because they look just like the world. Now, we know that touch stimulates visual cortex and vision modulates somatosensory cortex, the part that is concerned with touch. Whether trump oil stimulates somatosensory cortex remains to be tested and to be fun to do. Well, thank you for listening to me. I'm sorry, I'm not going to be able to stay for the question and answer. I am indulging myself and going to the opera and it starts at seven o'clock. But if you send your questions to Dawn, she'll pass them on to me and I promise I will respond on email. So thank you. Dr. Zadie, one quick thing. What, what uh, experiment or test do you think we could do to figure out the um, whether trompe l'oeil can stimulate that uh, somos sensory cortex? So what we need is for the development officer at this university to raise the money for an fMRI machine, a large seven Tesla one. And then with fMRI, we can show people trompe l'oeil. We can first look at identify where is somatosensory cortex and where is visual cortex. And we can see if somatosensory cortex is actually activated by Trump Floyd, but it all depends on the development officer. Well, I think we're gonna to have to, you and I will have to talk offline about some key donors and uh, see what we could do there. All right, good. Thank you, bye. All right. So that concludes our formal program, but I, I'm looking to the audience to see if there are any questions out there for Dr. Zadie, who has to jump off here in just a minute or two, um, Chris or Harry. Um, do, does anyone in the audience have questions for our presenters this evening? If so, please put them in the Q&A or the chat box and we're happy to, to share them with the rest of the group. I know you guys did such a wonderful job. It, it's very difficult to have additional questions. Um, do you have questions for each other? Oh, I have questions for Chris, but I'm going to send email to you to send to him. <laughs> Absolutely, we can, we can definitely connect you. And I'd like to come visit the Peter Museum sometime. Okay. And, okay. I'll, have, and I'll have Dawn give you an email about that.
Okay, thank you. And, and actually, it's very well known that Jasper Johns looked at a lot of John Pito and and is influenced by him. And there is and there is stuff written on it. Yeah. In fact, I think he said so when he first painted the flags. He got the idea of painting the flags from oh. John. Pito. And, oh. and, and you know, of course, that the last um, blooming of art, I mean, of uh, trompe l'oeil as a, as a frame painting technique, not as sets or murals, was in this country. And that was around Peter's time. Okay, we do have a question from the audience. Um, if someone has a visual impairment, will that affect their perception? Yes, okay. it will depend on the visual impairment, and and it would be, and if you have one, you should um, look at some uh, trompe oil paintings, which you can see very easily on on Google, and uh, and send the question to Dawn, and uh, she'll pass it on to me. Well, I have an interesting thing to add to that. Um, technically, I actually wear glasses which I'm not wearing now. And I learned how to paint without glasses because that's, I didn't realize I needed glasses until a little bit later in life. And um, when I put glasses on now, the trompe l'oeil effect actually jumps out even more so that I can actually see it. So it's kind of interesting that having learned to paint without glasses, I, I now I still can only paint without glasses because otherwise it looks too detailed to me. So it does affect you. Um, yeah, astigmatism, of course, affects everything you see unless you correct it. So, and, and it and it affects what the image that's forming on your retina. So it it affects any everything you see very early, even before the brain gets to work on it. I think that's one of the nice things about SUNY College of Optometry is that we have a um, wide range of services that we provide for eye care that's fully comprehensive. So everything from your comprehensive eye exam to advanced services, if you do have a particular eye condition or disease that needs uh, significant treatment. In fact, um, Chris, I'll, I'll just share that one of the things we learned along my journey here at the college is that he actually has, um, He's missing the very far end of the spectrum for seeing the color red. We had no idea until he had a fully comprehensive eye exam and actually participated in a clinical study here at the college. I just want to add something about um, for Chris also is that um, right now at the museum, we have a, uh, part of our display is about Trumploy in our real life now and um, how. You walk into any store and everything's full in your eye, every Christmas decoration, every holiday decoration. Uh, but Chris, one of the things I, I walked into a historical building in our town, they had these doors that are painted to look like expensive wood from the Victorian times. And when you were doing your frame, um, I just was like, that's how they did it. You know, it just it was made to look like more expensive. Um, that actually was one of the uses of Trump Loy when I was originally taught to do decorative painting, was to take an ordinary object um, and maybe even a door that was slightly ugly, like a uh, metal door, and, and to make them look more expensive and to add the materials that would be cost prohibitive to use. Like I've actually worked with a lot of builders where they want to use really expensive materials and they get the budget and there's just no way it's going to happen. So what they'll do is they'll use those real materials, the first six or eight feet of building, and then the rest of it's actually painted to match. Yeah. And when it's done right, nobody'd ever know the difference. Great. So we, we do have um, more of a, a comment than I think a, necessarily a question about, um, it would be fascinating to see an impressionistic landscape within a trompe l'oeil frame. Chris? I'm guessing this person would sure. love. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. One of um one of uh, Wynne Zimmeron's is a impressionistic painting where he did yeah. that faux finish of the frame, 
but he also has a piece of string going across and he has um, a Ninja Turtle, a plastic Ninja Turtle walking across <laughs> it. So it's very impressionistic, but then there's that pull your eye and surrealistic kind of thing. Well, that's pretty cool. I'll have to check it out. Yeah, go to any of the um, artists and you'll see, uh, you know, Wynn Zimmeron or Gary Irby, and you'll find a huge selection of what they, how they paint. Oh, we'll do. All right. Okay. And uh, we have another question about what would be the fatal flaw, the fatal flaws of a poorly executed Trump Loy painting. <laughs> <laughs> it. Uh... Uh, one of the things that that um, you really need to pay attention to in creating a Trump Loy painting. And um, I had to speed up the video to get into the time frame, but I did talk about this, is that, so a lot of times you'll use a lighting convention, let's say from the top um, right-hand corner at a 45 degree angle, and you get all your shadows coming down and you know where your light's gonna hit. And one of the fatal flaws is, is when people start bringing those lights into other areas that they shouldn't be where the light wouldn't naturally hit, it starts to ruin the whole form that's creating. So, you know, making sure you get your, your lights and your shades hitting like they realistically would. Um, another, another thing that is um, uh, poor drawing technique that, that oftentimes, you know, leads you to, it gets you in trouble if you don't spend enough time doing the drawing up front and figuring it out so that you do get the curves and the bends and things. That way, when you get to the actual painting of it, you're not trying to juggle too many ideas at one time, drawing and painting everything at once. So those, those are two things that really can kind of lead you in trouble as you're going down, um, you know, going down the path of creating some piece of uh, Trump Loy. Us at the museum, um, we, we're, we get phone calls. I think I have a pedo. And so we look at the painting and it's the angles are off. You know, the composition might be off from a, a traditional Pito painting. Uh, it might be the same objects. They signed it, John F. Pito. You know, uh, we even have one, though, that I'm really starting to wonder, is it a Pito? We don't think it's a Pito, but is it, is it maybe one of his studies they did for another painting? He didn't sign all his work. Um, he, he would sell work to the tourists, uh, the Methodists who would come by train from Philadelphia for the uh, Methodist camp meeting grounds. So quite often, I think one time so far, we've gotten like, I think you've got a pedo, just by looking at it. Well, thank you both so much. Um, unfortunately, Dr. Zaidi, as you mentioned, had to jump off. And there are a couple of additional questions um, that are much more on the scientific and vision oriented <laughs> side, which I would torture both of you with, but I, I think- <laughs> You like the more fun things on the artistic side. Um, so, but I do appreciate both of you joining us this evening. Um, Anissa, it, if you would put up the final slide um, for anyone in the audience who would like to know more about um, the Pedo Museum, about um, Chris Rigney and his work or um, the work that Dr. Zadie does here, um, feel free to join us. And if you wanna know more about the college, there is uh, also the college's website. We'll leave this up for a minute or two as everyone is logging off. Um, and look forward to seeing you on a future Luminary series. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.